Welcome to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast, brought to you by DSW Ministries. Your host is singer, songwriter, speaker, and domestic violence advocate, Diana Winkler. She is passionate about helping survivors in the church heal from domestic violence and abuse and trauma. This podcast is not a substitute for professional counseling or qualified medical help. Now, here is Diana. you guys doing? Welcome, welcome. It is almost summer here. It is 105 today outside and so I'm scrambling to protect my vegetable garden from getting scorched today. We put up some shade and getting out the mulch and the fertilizer and making sure the watering system works. So that's what I've been doing today. Other things that are going on I am probably going to lose my day job within the next two weeks here. I know I've talked about this before, but now it's inevitable that I will lose my job. I have no way of stopping it. I talked with HR on Friday. I can't give too many details here on the program, but if you want to know more about it or you have some job leads in healthcare, I'm also looking at changing industries with the transferable skills that I have. But yeah, it's scary. It's scary because I'm facing losing my home. I lose my health care. I am fervently sending out applications and networking and talking to my recruiter and my career coach. have all those things in place. If you would pray for me, I would appreciate that. So, with that being said, those of you who have been listening to the program and have been wanting to support me, but you haven't gotten around to it or you've been busy, now would be a great time. I have lots of resources on my website, dswministries.org. So I have a mentoring program to help folks who are transitioning out of an abusive situation. I have music on my website. I have a store to purchase said music. I also have t-shirts for the podcast. I teach vocal lessons and you already know I'm a public speaker. So if you've got any events within Arizona that I could drive to, women's events or conferences, I am going to be available shortly, and I'll be happy to be a keynote speaker at your event. Let's talk. The Lord is going to take care of us, as He always has. The Lord has provided so far. I do need your prayers, please. Job leads. I know you guys are going through some really hard times, some of which are financial, so I'm not I'm not talking to y'all who are struggling financially to give or purchase anything. Just those that have been wanting to support me in one way or another. I have a donation page on my website. Buy me a coffee, buy me lunch, buy me dinner. (laughs) In differing amounts that you can support me at this time. I'm not a high-pressure salesperson. I don't like promoting myself. That's hard for me. But I'm reaching out for support today for you loyal listeners. And that's all I'm going to say about that today. But we're going to transition into my interview today. My guest, Brenna Kovalins, is here from the podcast Beyond Christian. I'm going to have her introduce herself, but I was on her show probably six months ago, and we had a great time, and I listen to her podcast all the time, and she is a really great podcaster, very passionate about the topics that she speaks on, and I've been wanting to have her come on and talk about dating and sex and maybe some Bible topics. Because I heard her talk about it on her show, and I think you guys would benefit from that. She is a phenomenal young lady, and 
We're just going to call this Girl Talk. That's what I'm going to title my podcast. Because we're going to be talking about a lot of different things, but it's pretty much going to be about Girl Talk. A lot of giggling going on, and we have a little bit of fun here. But it might remind you of a slumber party that you might have been to. (laughs) But she's a great gal. You're going to just love her. So the guys, you're still invited to listen, but just saying that there's going to be a lot of girls giggling and talking about intimate things. And yeah, some of these things are embarrassing or hard to talk about, but we both agree that these things need to be talked about. So here we go. Here is my fun conversation with Brenna Kovalens. All right. Please welcome Brenna Kovalens to the show. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Thanks for finally uh, coming on the show. I mean, I came on to your podcast and we had such a great time that like you got to come on my podcast now. That's what we do as podcasters. We just go on each other's shows. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, hey, when I, I you did the talking last time, now it's my turn. <laughs> yeah, you get to do all the talking now. Oh, good. And, no pressure. <laughs> you know, I'm like, a fan of your show. I listen to your podcast all the time, as you already know, and you come up with such great topics and you're so transparent and honest and you don't pretend to be somebody you're not. And I'm like, man, she's got such good content. I got to have her on the show. So, uh, <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. Cause I feel like I'm more awkward in my own head than when I sound like I'm actually talking to someone else. Like, <laughs> you know, when you're overthinking what you're saying, I'm like, did I just say that correctly? <laughs> I totally do that. I, I can tell that you do the research on your your podcast for all of your topics and and you have, you know, Bible quotes and keep it Christ-centered. And that's one of the things I love in you're in the younger generation. I forget. What age group are you in? Oh, take a guess. Let's see if you can guess it right. I'm going to guess 26. Yep. You got a nail on the head. You got it. Maybe I was paying attention more than I thought. I hope so. <laughs> but I, I try to get some more younger blood here on the podcast for change things up because you probably wouldn't be able to guess my age, but I will be pretty old in the <laughs> <laughs> If I guess too high or too low, it's a bad thing. You already heard about my bad day, so uh, <laughs> we'll give each other a little grace here. We we did, um, but you guys listening, you guys have to listen to her podcast. And my favorite one was the one you did. You did one on Bible study, and I was like, that was so good. That is something I'm. I got inspired to do my own series in the future of doing. How do you do a Bible study? So people, they they don't know. Anyway, you were like the Instagram girl and you look like a model or something. Are you a model? No. (laughs) Well, in this lane, which the audience can't see, I look like Casper. But besides that, no. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's just the audio today. But I did not do the intro for you. Today, I'm going to have you do your own bio, your own intro. Tell the folks about yourself. Okie dokie. Well, my name is Brenna Cublins. I am 26 years old, as you guys already know now. I'm from Northeastern Pennsylvania, and I am the podcast host of Beyond Just Christian Podcasts. Um, I started that back in technically the end of 2020, but I didn't upload until 2021, my first episode. Then my first episode was Ways 2020 Tested Me. And I don't know, I just, I really like talking, sometimes a little bit too much. And I wanted to share the love of God and Jesus with others. And then also kind of talk about both myself and Jesus in a relatable way beyond just the Christian normal. So that's pretty much displaying all my imperfections out there and just sharing my experience from my teenage years to my early slash mid twenties. Cool. So what? Did God put on your heart to share with us today? What are we going to talk about? <laughs> well, this one's been brewing for a while. Um, uh, today, I'm going to be talking about my personal testimony with 
um, sex. And this is a very, I feel like it's both a lighthearted and heavy topic at the same time, because I've learned the hard way, but then God has, you know, used that to create beautiful connections of other people and share our stories together. And it's also been like a safe place for other women, my friends, strangers included. So we're going to be talking about uh, God's design for sex, um, conviction versus instincts, and then also how sex can affect us physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. This is a great topic, and I've heard you talk on this already, and you get so personal on this topic. You're so brave. It's like you saying, sharing stuff like, wow, I would, I probably wouldn't say that about myself because I'd be too embarrassed, and you, you say, I'm so embarrassed to say this, but cheers to you for getting out there and saying it because some people need to hear it. Our personal yeah. stories. We need to just just rip the band-aid off and just just say it. <laughs> like, I don't know if it's a generational thing, but the topic of sex is just so I don't know, main I don't want to say mainstream because I don't like mainstream topics, but it's very straightforward now. It's not so taboo like it used to be. And I feel like people by age um unfortunately say it a lot more secular and worldly. But at the same time, I feel like it also needs to be talked about in the Christian community because it's, again, taboo in the church. You don't really learn about it. And it's just a topic where people might feel uncomfortable and there might be some trauma there that's not really addressed. Oh, you hit the nail on the head. And I think that our society now is so incredibly saturated with sex everywhere, but we still can't talk about it. We're still like embarrassed to talk about things that we need to know. And my generation, we didn't talk about stuff with our parents, but we'd talk amongst ourselves. I think I was pretty fortunate to be around friends or I had adult friends that would talk about sex with me or I was a big library geek. I still am. I would just go to the library and check out books. <laughs> this was before the internet, sister. <laughs> We had to go into the library and look in a card catalog and go look for the book and check at it out of the library. So that's pretty much how I learned about sex. And my parents were pretty embarrassed to talk about it. But they did, you know, in their defense, they did give me a book. They gave me a book. I don't remember the name of the book, but it was a cartoon book about, you know, birds and the bees. <laughs> And that was that was about it until, oh, my dad found my diary and I had all these really personal things in there. Oh no! <laughs> and I was using the f bomb because that was what I, you know, what teenagers do. We use profanity in our own diaries, and and I was hanging out with boys, and he would say, you know, are you are you going all the way with these boys? And I said, no, we're just hanging out. And he's like, well, you shouldn't use the F word as in that way. It's called making love. It's not, that's derogatory to use the F word for that. And my dad was pretty cool, but my mom was kind of embarrassed to talk about anything in that department. But what was your sex education like? <laughs> you know, I feel like as I got older, my mom and I talked about it a lot more, but as a kid, it was, again, not a topic of discussion. And I feel like back then, obviously it wasn't, well, I can't say obviously to me, it wasn't on my mind. Um, I don't think I've actually thought about sex like in my life until my first boyfriend, but growing up, you know, again, like you said, it was a taboo topic and my parents and I didn't talk about it. Um, it's kind of funny because, you know, when all, I don't know if you're, when your school, if your school ever did this when you were younger, but uh, for me in fourth grade, we had that one class that all the girls would go to, and we would talk about our body changes, puberty, of course, all the things that the boys don't need to know. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and that would be including, you know, feelings, like pretty much about sex. And I was the only girl who did not go to the class because my mom didn't want me to. You would think that she would want me to, right? But she wanted to be the one to teach me that stuff. And back then, I didn't understand. I was just embarrassed. I'm like, yeah, I'm the only girl who's on the class right now. 
Meanwhile, I'm surrounded by boys in this one classroom watching dinosaur movies. And I'm just like, oh, this isn't so bad. Okay. I just ditched out of the class. And I don't have to go to because I got permission not to go. But I did feel like I was missing something. And the first time I really actually got into the nitty ditty or yeah, ditty <laughs> gritty detail <laughs> of uh, sex was in fifth grade. So fifth grade came around and there's a new girl in my school and she had these rubber bracelets. They're just like regular rubber bracelets in different colors, nothing special, but she would show them to her friends and to the whole classroom when the teachers weren't really paying attention uh, during recess and all that. And she's like, yeah, this bracelet represents this. This one means you've done this. And it's basically different bases of sexual acts that she talked about incorporating these uh, bracelets. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound very good. Like that doesn't sound appropriate for our age. And I had really good discernment back then, I think, to where I could tell what should not be talked about in such a easy, cool, collective manner. Um, Especially when you're fifth grade, you know, it's very young. Yeah, you could learn about it. But when you're kind of bragging about how you got the bracelets, it's a little concerning. (laughs) I -hmm. can't imagine being my mom at the time when I told her this story and, uh, she contacted the school and of course the next two days suddenly the girl hit my guts but that's besides the point like I didn't know really anything about sex and I didn't really care because I knew I wasn't going to have it but then of course when you get older and you have a boyfriend suddenly you feel those things and you're like oh okay now I'm here now I wish I would have listened and known more yeah we had the class I went to public school so when uh, it was fifth grade when we had sex ed and my parents signed the permission slip and they were like thrilled because they didn't have to do it. <laughs> but I, uh, I kind of got the graphic details of what the mechanics were for my next door neighbor. She was like one of those bad girls. Oh goodness. <laughs> she, you know, she, she bluntly told me what, what the actual act was. Cause you know, the teachers were um, very um, formal when they taught the sex ed and played the video. But so was the dinosaur movie, was it like Jurassic Park and it was cool or what? What, what did you watch? <laughs> it, was, um, it was some movie from uh, Disney Channel. I forget what it's called. It was an animated Pixar movie. Land Before Time or something? Uh, no, but that was a good one. That was my one of my favorites. That was the cartoon version, though. I mean, I've been totally cool if it was Jurassic Park, but <laughs> I would have loved it a little bit more then. <laughs> but <sighs> yeah, it was just I I remember too, like my mom. Again, we grew up. Well, I grew up in a Christian household, and you know, the most I got from my parents was my mom would tell me, "Just don't have sex. It's messy." She wasn't lying, but at the same time, that's all I got. And then my dad was said, don't have sex or I'll kill the guy. You know, like most dads will say who are protective oh, yeah. of their only yeah. daughters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty much. He was slightly joking, you know, slightly. So um, even now at this age, I think he likes to think of me as a pure virgin, <laughs> to say the least. He doesn't <laughs> ask that stuff even now. He doesn't want to know the answers. <laughs> Yeah, our parents don't really want to know what we did. And oh. frankly, we don't want to know anything about their sex life either. So, oh, heck, that's disgusting. <laughs> well, to an extent, I mean, had I known my parents weren't virgins when they got married, I think I would have been a little less offended. <laughs> oh, yeah. My, I just found out my mother smoked marijuana when she was, when oh she was in the 70s. So I'm like, what? <laughs> what else do I don't know? Oh, gosh, they're keeping secrets from you. (laughs) (laughs) When growing up, again, I feel like my sex education wasn't up to par. And, um, you know, my parents were like, well, we trust her. You know, I had a really good conscience. I had a good head on my shoulders. I kind of hated most of the boys in my school anyway. (laughs) They were Mm -hmm. just mostly jerks. They were looking for some fun. That was pretty much it. And I knew that. Um, And then I got into a relationship with ladies and gents don't do this online I didn't know the guy in person but he had a bunch of mutual friends and I was like oh okay and then I realized it was one of my classmates brothers uh but he lived uh, like an hour away because his parents were divorced and she lived next to my hometown whereas he lived in you know different towns away uh so we started talking and we met in person of course and 
you know, we're dating for about two, three years of her life. Um, but at the same time, I didn't know how to go into this relationship with purity and intentionality as a Christian girl, because I, you know, these, these feelings were new to me. I didn't really know how to deal with feeling turned on or again, being like TMI. I didn't know how to deal with my urges or how do I maneuver this? Because growing up, I heard, okay, there's first base, second base, third base and home run. As long as you don't make the home run, you are fine. I didn't know that any kind of sexual encounter was considered sex. I thought it had to be insertion and that was that, you know? Yeah, a lot of those terms get thrown around because, well, back in my day, it was Bill Clinton era. You know, I did not have sex with sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> and technically, he didn't, he didn't have intercourse, but they were, you know, doing oral sex, which I consider sex because you're, you're bringing each other to orgasm. That is sex, in my opinion. The lines get blurred. They definitely do. Like no one tells you really that there are certain boundaries. So that's the word. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, oh, I could do this as long as I don't go all the way. I'm still safe. And that's a big misconception in my opinion. Yeah. For me, if I get, get too far down in the makeout session, it's like, okay, it's like going downhill. <laughs> you're going downhill it's really hard to stop because <laughs> let's be honest you're like your hormones are racing you know it's new to you it's a new experience you're curious and like I said curiosity killed the cat <laughs> but it definitely doesn't help when you don't know how to face these emotions head on you know it's like mm-hmm. oh well I could do this it's fine it's okay you know if I don't like it I just stop but most of the time let's be honest you're not gonna not like it Unless someone does completely something out of your comfort range that's way above what you think, then you don't know about it. Yeah, there are definitely people that they may not like it because they possibly had some trauma that they haven't dealt with. And so that whole department is, you know, causes a lot of pain. And yeah, it may be. Okay, he didn't use any lube. <laughs> He's <laughs> pushing too hard, or yeah. uh, you know, there's definitely technique involved. And if you're young and neither of you know what you're doing, there's, uh, yeah, sometimes it isn't comfortable. It isn't comfortable the first time for the girls, anyway. But yeah, let's uh, talk about your relationship with God at that time. When when did you meet the Lord? in a personal way when did you get saved you know I was always in a Christian household and I always loved Jesus I always believed he existed but I don't think my faith really developed until I mean if we're talking fully like get into like the new details of my faith like you know understanding God more as who he is as a you know supernatural being probably honestly a little bit before ninth grade stars that was technically a little bit before my first boyfriend so I feel that I wasn't fully strong yet in my faith because I thought oh I love God all my life I'm good you know but that was also uh, let's see eighth grade was the year no seventh grade it was seventh grade seventh grade was the year I started having really severe depression and I think it's just because life changes uh family changes and everything else going on like adjustment wise to being a teenager you know of course, it's a different, it's a weird time of your life. Let's be honest. Any yeah. kind of teenager will go through this. Let's be real. Um, but I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know that my depression was something everyone went through. I thought it was just against me. Um, and then there's also a lot of spiritual warfare in my life too. Like I had nightmares. I would second guess if I was saved. Again, it's all spiritual attacks, but I didn't know how to deal with it. So I feel at the time, which I won't admit, and I don't think I've admitted this on a podcast before, I kind of made my boyfriend at the time, in a sense, my savior. And I rely on him for things that only Jesus could do for me. Mm. So to answer that question, just to sum it up in one sentence, I feel my faith wasn't as fully developed yet, even though it was gradually getting there. So you didn't really have any like convictions or 
anything like in concrete yet about what was right and what was wrong as far as dating or sex goes. Yeah, because like, you know, I didn't really have that conviction, but I did have the fear of my parents. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I was like, oh, crap. Okay, as long as I don't get caught doing this, you know. And there's been some close encounters where my mom wa- almost walked in on us. And we're like, shoot, pull away, pull away. You know, like, but we weren't fully having sex yet. Because, again, actually, no, me and him, like, again, if we look, if I look at it now, it was sex. But we didn't, you know, go to home run, I should say. Uh, but it was still for a second, definitely third, if we're counting it as bases. But yeah, I didn't have that conviction. I mostly had the fear of my parents finding out, you know, I didn't want to push all the way, but at the same time, I was willing to kind of blur those boundary lines. Yeah, I think f- fear of pregnancy mm. <laughs> on top of the fear of your parents finding out is a big deterrent. Yeah until you figure out what birth control is. Uh, (laughs) We could touch on that later. So when exactly was it that that God was real and he was in your life every day and you started thinking, well, I need need to live a life that pleases God. Mm -hmm. You know, my sin was uh, habitual. it was, how do I explain it? I didn't learn with the first boyfriend. I just kind of kept, not in a sense going, but I, again, had, I think my own issues in every relationship, even if it was a good relationship, I kind of ended up ruining it. Um, for example, my boyfriend, when I was 21, 22 years old, I was technically fully now and an adult. So um, I was in college at the time too. I think this was the year before I dropped out because I couldn't juggle my life at this age. Um, I think part of it was from a relationship I wasn't really fully ready for, but with a boyfriend at the time, me and him went fully all the way. This, I considered him my first, but when I look back, of course, now it's, I'm like, eh, I get that he was technically my first, but he really technically wasn't. <laughs> it's like that weird situation, you know? Um, but we had sex and it's, it's not funny. I just say it's funny because it's just like, I look back and want to smack myself in the head. Uh, you know, he asked me, because he's also a Christian too, um, developing his walk with the Lord. Um, I don't want to say we're baby Christians, but we are also, you know, in different paths of our lives. He was seven years older, whereas I was, you know, younger in college. He had a full-time job. He also had a seven-year-old son at the time. And he asked me, are you comfortable with fully going all the way and I said yes and I feel like I could have easily cut all these later struggles in my life in that moment I could have just said no and you know I could have resisted the devil would have fled and I would have saved myself a lot of heartache throughout the years because of course it didn't end with him so anyway we had sex and it became more of a common thing you know I was with him for a year which isn't that long in my opinion but you know we're doing it a lot. And, uh, I, I never struggled with lust before until that relationship, even when I was dating as a teenager, I never had lust. I never had any issues. And like, I'm not, I'm just going to be blunt. I never had any issues with masturbation before. Mm-hmm. I never thought like lustfully for someone's body. And again, I was older now. So I'm like, okay, I know more now. So I'm more comfortable with it. And it kept going until I felt really out of control of my life. Um, and it sucks too, because the guy I was dating, he was a really good person. We had our issues. He had his issues. I had my issues. But at the same time, he did nothing wrong. I ended up mis- betraying his trust. And we ended up breaking up. So I was like, I really can't do this anymore. And, you know, the conviction is like too strong. But I know staying in this relationship where I first sinned with somebody this much is it's just not good for me so we ended it um mostly on my terms but now here I am broken up and I don't know how to deal with this less and it hasn't gone away even after breaking that relationship off and I feel I easily let temptation in and I easily let bad relationships in and it resulted in like things like hooking up once but 
it was still enough to really, really just make me feel crud. Like I was just, I did not feel good with myself. I think that was one of the lowest points in my life besides my depression in seventh, eighth, ninth grade. Like this was probably worse because it was my doing versus, you know, spiritual warfare, you know, it was different. It was all on me and I didn't know how to deal with that responsibly. Yeah, I get it. And when you awaken something like sex, it opens the floodgates. Your body's like, for lack of a better term, woken up. Yeah, I had a real problem with lust too. I'm admitting that as well. What kind of lessons did you learn about dating and God? And what kind of convictions did you come up with in this well, process? That's a good question. I wrote it down too, because I know I wouldn't be able to remember everything off the top of my head. Um, another, well, one thing that I learned about conviction slash dating lessons was that I couldn't please a boyfriend more than God. Um, and by that, I mean, I felt I had to put on uh, not a show for a boyfriend, but I felt like, okay, if I'm feeling uncomfortable, it must be because I'm doing something wrong. Like meaning maybe I didn't do this position correctly. Um, so I feel like that was like a miss, something I was like overthinking. But then I realized, okay, I shouldn't even be worrying about this because I'm not married. <laughs> He's not my husband. Right. So, you know, just to not give the goodies to the man who's not even putting the ring on your finger, you know, who hasn't said yes to you at the aisle. <laughs> um, that's one of them. Some of the lessons I learned weren't even from the one who was seven years older. Some of the lessons were learned from my uh, latest ex um before we actually answer those questions is it okay if I go into a little bit of that story too because oh yeah sure go ahead I didn't even think about that to now that's like the most I think influential it just gets worse goes from like bad to worse <laughs> um I'm giving myself time to be single and I was very determined I am not going to date for a whole year and I'm going to wait until the Lord brings me to someone which I don't think the Lord's going to always bring you someone like you got to sometimes look and do the hard work too. But, you know, I was determined to just stay single and focus on what the Lord had for me. Cause you know, my singleness was pleasing to him and I didn't want to rush and I had a lot of healing to do. So that didn't really happen. I ended up getting into a relationship with someone else who was a really great guy. His family was Christian. He had strong faith. Um, all the things you think from meeting somebody Um, and then unfortunately, I don't know if I ever told you this, but my ex at the time, he ended up going to jail for seven and a half months of our year relationship. And again, that's a whole nother story. That's his business, but I didn't break it off. You know, we kept pursuing each other, you know, being there for each other. And when he got back home, which is funny. So I told his mom how I was feeling. I'm like, listen, when your son gets back home, I haven't had physical touch with this man in a while. And like, I wasn't even trying to think sexually. It just, you know, we haven't actually touched, you know, I would visit him every now and then, but we couldn't like hug each other. We couldn't do certain things in person because you're in a jail. You're, it's not supposed to be laughy, gaggly, good times. You know, it's jail. It's how it is. And sometimes we would talk over like through a glass, like, you know, so, yeah, things um, and talk. Uh, so when he got out, you could bet all those hormones were raised. And I'm just like, yeah, here we go. We first night or two we had sex, and I think that's what really I was like, oh crap, okay. I mean, I can't bl- I can't blame myself for not like missing his affection and his touch, but I could blame myself for allowing that. And it turns out we did it a lot more than I did with my other ex. I'm not trying to like TMI, like some of the stuff doesn't need to be said again. No, you're, but... you're being honest and setting the stage for us. We appreciate that. And this is the, you know, this is the time I was on birth control. Like I'm fully on birth control, but even then I didn't trust it. My one friend, she's my, one of my best friends. She's like, Brenna, I got pregnant when I was on birth control. So that doesn't mean much of anything. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, he was just telling me like, he's a scum. <laughs> um don't be with him you know all he wants is sex and I didn't really know how to leave and that's when I started like sinking into depression more and more so we would like 
have sex a lot. And then I think that is when I really learned that the Holy Spirit was definitely inside of me, like convicting me. I've never felt so much conviction in my life. It was like, you know, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it's loving, but it's also authoritative and like affirming what you don't want to do sometimes. Like you need to break up with this guy. He ain't feeding your soul. And if you let, you know, for me, I would see so many Bible verses saying, break up with him, break up with him. This is not love. This is not love. This is not what I have for you. This is not in my design. This is not in my purpose. This is not bringing you closer to me. It's separating you from me. Um, and then I would hide in my own shame because I didn't want to approach God and be like, I did it again, Lord, because, you know, you had promised God, I'm not going to do it again. And I did it again. You know, it was just, it was more condemning. It was like driving a, a hole through our relationship pretty much. And I knew it had to end with me, how to start with me. And I'm just like, okay. So we finally broke it off, lost all contact. But at this point, it wasn't like my other ex where I felt lustful. I I hated sex. I did not want to think about it. I did not want to do anything. I occasionally had sexual urges and temptations to like touch myself, but I I never wanted to have sex again. I was like, I don't want to get married. I don't want to be in a relationship. I don't want to do anything. And I never felt like that before. So I was like, I'm just like, I'm giving up on love. I could die single the rest of my life and I'm good. <laughs> Lord, I'm good. <laughs> well, yeah, you went through a traumatic experience and um, that's normal. It's natural for you to respond that way. You go to the other side of the pendulum uh, because you're realizing I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. I can totally relate with that Holy Spirit thing because... I had the same thing. I was dating an atheist and I was having sex and we were in love. Probably one of the first persons I loved in my life. And God was telling me and my Christian friends were telling me and the Bible was telling me you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. Oh, but I love him, God. I love him. And, and yeah, we were the same way. We were very active. And, and the hardest, one of the hardest things I ever did in my life was all right, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to break up with him. And he didn't even know it was coming. And we were just <laughs> having a picnic in, in the park. And I just told him that we have to break up. And it just, he wasn't a, he, he wasn't one of those people like, like your guy was a jerk or a former convict. This was a good person who cared about me. And, and it was devastating to him. It was horrible. <laughs> Uh, but I had that conviction God's telling me the Holy Spirit's telling me God's words telling me you need to stop doing this and um, so conviction conviction is different than a preference or discernment right yeah so I actually looked up the definition of conviction compared to the others and I wrote down, it's a formal declaration that someone is guilty. Um, And when people see the word guilty, they're like, oh, crud. Does the Holy Spirit love me then? He's convicted me. Um, It's more of, hey, it's like a tap on the shoulder. You know, you're not supposed to be doing this. You know, this isn't making you feel that good. Um, You should really stop doing this. Um, And then discernment is the ability to judge well and to determine something. And I had that discernment. I was just not listening to the one who is true judge Jesus, you know, like I was like, well, no, I want to go by my own human flesh wisdom that I have because I think I can handle this and control the situation. And in reality, I couldn't control it because here I was having sex with a guy who told me if he didn't have sex with me, we weren't really together or, you know, go find a fruit loop guy then who won't have sex with you. He said, you know, it's, it was very coerced. It was one-sided. It felt like, you know, he wasn't willing to give it up. So I listened to his words more than the Holy Spirit. And that's when I was like, well, that's not love. And that's when it, you know, broke apart. But, you know, the, the Spirit's just like, this is not what I have for you. This is, not, his fruit is bitter and dry and dead. It's not the fruit that I have. Like you could tell someone by their fruit. And that sounds like a funny saying. It's a Christian saying for sure, but you know, you can tell what fruit they reap or 
harvest or whatever the word is. You can see the evidence. That's what yeah. we would call for it. There's, you can see it. It's obvious. It's tangible, right? And, you know, I was, I was convicted and I was definitely getting that guilty feeling like, okay, Holy Spirit, you do know better than I do. I really do need to fall through what you're telling me. And it was like every single day you wake up, you go to bed, you feel it. And I just couldn't ignore it anymore. And no matter what I did, whether it was right or wrong, I had no control. And I was like, okay, I'm listening, stepping away. Here we go. (laughs) But it was also like, well, what's next, God? Because I really don't feel okay. I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm broken. How do I recover from the situation? It's like, okay, you went from having sex a lot and then not having sex at all and not wanting wanting anything to do with that. But eventually it comes back. It does. <laughs> That's how the Lord wired us. <laughs> uh, I mean, how do you learn to deal with those urges that honors Christ? I mean... Ooh, you see, this is the part where I'm going to get into the verse part because I had, you know, when the Holy Spirit gives you a verse and you're like, okay, I need the whole thing. Cause I remember bits and pieces, but I feel like to better explain it, I kind of made a bunch of ideas on how to help those urges or like to not give in per se. Um, some people are softies and other people need to be like kind of that, you know, they need to repeat to you over and over again in a serious, like upfront manner, you know, because I learned better from my mistakes, which again, I couldn't, I could have prevented a lot of mistakes here, but the Holy Spirit's very firm with me. He wasn't like, he used scripture. All right. You know, everything that I learned over the years, I didn't even knew I knew he brought up. Mm. So the first thing I want to say is that God does not tempt you that is completely the devil. And I, it kind of convicted me there too, because I figured, okay, if I don't listen to the Holy spirit, I'm just following the devil's way. And that's not going to lead me any closer to Christ. That's going to separate us. So the verse that came to mind when I wanted to write down, God doesn't tempt was from James one chapter 12 to 15. Uh, it says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which can drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And that verse perfectly sums up why I was feeling the way I was, because I wasn't given, you know, I wasn't allowing life to grow it was more death and sin and it wasn't even god's you know uh honor and whatsoever so that's the first thing i wrote is god does not tempt you (laughs) that's a great verse it's very long so it's hard to remember but yes i love that one (laughs) um and then i also wrote down i don't want to be a slave to sin and i am not a slave to sin that was another way to help me kind of resist urge whether it was you know masturbation or having sex again um second peter 2 19 says you are a slave to whatever controls you and here i was being controlled by this sexual urge and desire and i was like okay do i really want to be a slave to this because that's not my identity that's not what i'm supposed to do as in luke 9 23 says we're supposed to pick up our cross daily and deny ourselves so mm-hmm. not only are we denying Satan, but we're denying our flesh and we're denying what we think is right that God calls us to tell us isn't not right whatsoever. And then another thing I wrote down was from Romans 6, 16. Well, I wrote down 16 uh, verses 16, 18. It says, don't you realize that you become a slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves to sin, but now you are wholeheartedly obeying this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. And 
a lot of people are like kind of confused and they're like, well, I thought you were a slave before to sin and here you are a slave to righteous living. How does that make any sense? Another word for slave could be servant. It could be a follower. It could be, mm-hmm. um, it could be, you know, just the person of God, like a godly person. And I rather live righteously than sinfully and laboring in vain per se. <laughs> and then I'm sorry, I have a little bit more if that's okay. Absolutely. Let's hear it. All right. So another thing that I wrote down was taking every thought captive, um, which the verse that came to mind was from 2 Corinthians 10. It says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. So yeah, you can have those thoughts, but you're going to give it right to God. Like, hey, I need your help dealing with this because I really can't deal with it on my own. I'm human. I'm flawed. I'm sinful. Like, And by doing that, you're also confessing. And I feel like with confessing to God, you also need to have accountability partners because if you have a friend or family member or even a counselor, mentor, whatever you want to call it, you could tell someone, hey, I'm having these urges. Can you bring me back on track? And like, whether it's, you know, affirming my good deeds of staying away from that or it's telling me don't do this because look what happened last time. Just that simple reminder so praying for each other is a big one. It says so in James 5, um, verse 18. And then another thing too, um, which I didn't write down a verse for, but rebuking Satan in the moment, because wherever temptation is, it that's not from God. So if you know it's not from God, you know that there are principalities and evil spiritual warfare going around you. So clearly, who's influencing that? Um, Satan, the devil. So rebuking Satan and just saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke these thoughts. I rebuke any evil actions that I want to do to either myself, someone else, whatever. And just calling him out of his BS and be like, nope, not today. (laughs) today. (laughs) Lastly, for that one, like how to ignore urges, I wrote down um, other energy exerting activities. Like for me, I love the outdoors. I love to hike. I love Mm -hmm. to walk. Anything where I could actually physically move my body that's not in a sexual way, I'm still like getting that dopamine, you know, rushed and all that fun stuff. So, but without the sin part. Yeah, those feel good hormones. Yeah, exactly. It's good for your body. Exercise and nature. Uh, you, You made a lot of really great points, great Bible verses. I'm going to unpack them a little more from my perspective. Sex was intended to be like dessert, the cherry on the top, right? Yeah. Not the main course of your life. And even as a married person, and I've been married twice, even though you're you're told to be fruitful and multiply, and that's the relationship you have sex with. So even when you're married, it, it can't be the main course. Because you got kids, you have duties, you have job. You have all this stuff. And so if you have a lust problem before you're married, you're going to have a lust problem after you're married. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll tell you that at my age, the lust is not as, it's not as strong as it was when I was 20. Thank God. (laughs) That would, that would be bad. Uh, And you're going to go through seasons of life where, okay, even if you're married, there are going to be times when you have to be celibate, either pregnancy, your childbirth, uh, your your spouse is sick, or your uh, your spouse is in the military, or you name all kinds of th- reasons why you can't have sex, and you're going to have to control your urges. You're going to have to deal with those things. But in my experience, are you familiar with the two dogs analogy? You've got the good dog and you've got the bad dog. You put them in a room to fight. Well, who's going to win, the good dog or the bad dog? The one that you feed, right? Okay. You want the good dog to win, so you're going to feed that dog. You're not going to feed the quote-unquote bad dog. It's the same with, with sex. Whether you're single or you're married, you have to be careful not to feed those urges. Like I don't watch certain movies. You know, I've been a Christian a long time, and I consider myself a mature Christian, and I'm not a prude or anything, but 
certain like you know I watch a movie and there's this love scene and it's pretty hot <laughs> and I'm like you know I don't think I need to see that because that just stir some things up and if you're not able at that time of your life to have sex then then you got to go to bed <laughs> with all those hormones right <laughs> yeah no, that's true we've got the internet now we've got sex saturated internet twitter facebook so much even just driving down the street you got these billboards i mean we can't avoid it completely right i mean it's 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 around us but you don't have to let it nest in your head right yeah we're human beings we're gonna like okay here comes a sex scene or um my friend's handing me some porn i do have some guy listeners too my friend's showed me some porn on the computer we know we're not supposed to watch that that doesn't honor anybody it's it's not wrong to have a physical reaction to those things but you do have control over whether you're going to stay there and watch it right yeah. you have control over as you were pointing out you with your boyfriend you guys would have third base which is pretty much making out and you're touching each other's body parts you have control over whether you get into that situation or not, right? Yeah. I personally, and I did some of this in dating, I wouldn't I wouldn't be a, a alone completely with a guy because, you know, those things could happen. We could go farther than we want to. We could feed into that, into that lust when we're not supposed to, right? You got to draw the line in the sand. Where are we going to stop? What are we not going to do? And yeah, we're not going to sit on the couch when there's nobody around and kiss and make out because it's going to feed that. It's going to feed those urges. And I didn't prep you for this, but what what are your thoughts about masturbation? You you kind of touched on it and some people have different views on that. Do you think it fuels the fire or is it like a release? Oh gosh, like the best way I could sum it up is I feel like the, God sees everything. Okay, well, he, he wants to see it. He sees everything. So it's like, okay, this is going to sound disgusting because there's some sick people out there, but it's like purposely, you know, pulling on your pants and doing it in front of someone who is in your family member. And it's just, no, it's uncomfortable. It's awkward. And we as human beings like to tune out God sometimes. So, like, well, we don't want to. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to see that. You know, we don't need your words of wisdom. So I feel like that's what I did. But at the same time, I knew that he was still there. Because again, once you got the Holy Spirit in you, you can't get rid of him because, you know, you accepted him for real, for real. You know, he's not going to let you sin the same way you used to. Once my sexual sin like grew, so did my conviction. And that's when I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. Like, oh, it's not satisfying. Like, I didn't get anything out of that. And it feels like when I look at it now, I'm just like, I felt gross <laughs> towards the end. Like it wasn't like at first, like, oh, okay. So this is how I could like, so quote unquote, help the guy help me. But then now with a more pure mind intended, I'm just like, no, no, can't do it. And plus I never watched porn. So that was, well, I'm thing. saying, I'm not saying with porn, I'm saying without the porn. Yeah, no, it just, it got awkward, uncomfortable and still. God's like, nope. We you just do- felt like God was watching. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but God's like, I could still see you. I see what's going on. Like, it's like hiding behind a skinny tree and closing your eyes and hoping they don't see you because, you know, you don't see them. <laughs> you know, I've grown in my faith, but back then I would have tried to get some satisfaction even if I couldn't have sex. And I was like, eh, this isn't doing this job, which is a good thing. It doesn't work. You know, it doesn't make me happy or feel good. But at the same time, just like, why did I even allow myself to do that? It's it's just an honestly embarrassing. It feels shameful. And I'm just like, Lord, thinking about it, it makes me want to ask you for uh, forgiveness again. Because I'm like, oh, shaking my head. Stop it. Stop well, it, brother. Let's talk about that. Because that's why I asked that question off the cuff is, what if we haven't been listening to the Holy Spirit when he convicts us of open sin in our life? And what if we've been doing all these things? Is there hope for us? I mean, does God still love me if maybe I screwed up and I'm I'm doing these things that we're talking about? There's always hope when it comes to God. 
you know, he's not going anywhere. He wants you to be with him in heaven. He wants you to love him back. He wants you to view yourself the way he views you. But at the same time, when you're in that moment, you're like, well, I just feel so much shame. I feel so much anguish. Like, what did I just do? Or what have I done all these years? I haven't been like listening to you. Like, I'm sorry. Like, you can't say sorry enough because you're going to sin every day, the rest of your life, whether it's Mm -hmm. sexually, intentionally or not, you're not a perfect human being. And granted, I feel like people say they're not perfect. Is there like an excuse to sin more? I say it where we're made in God's image, but we're not God. Right. Lost that privilege of being in a perfect world from our own actions. But at the same time, if we weren't worth it, God would have just kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden and said, okay, screw you guys. Bye. I don't need you. <laughs> or just wipe them off the planet. <laughs> if he did that to us, it'd be against himself. You know, he wouldn't be God. He wouldn't be love. He wouldn't be light. You know, he wouldn't have done that to us, but he instead sent his son to die on the cross for us. And take all of our sin physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually on a cross, both mercifully and wrathfully. And he, he endured that for us. You know, John mm-hmm. 10, 10 says, Jesus's purpose was to give us a rich and satisfying life. Uh, whereas the devil's, you know, goal is to steal, kill and destroy. So even though there is damage on one side, on the other side, Jesus has restoration for us. You know, he wants to give us a satisfying life. And by doing that, he gave himself to us and there's the point of that is I, I got on a tangent but yes there is still hope for us that's for sure yeah I like those kind of tangents <laughs> and uh continue with that too as okay again I have so many verses and I'm really I felt like I was overwhelming myself with all these verses that I wrote down but I feel like people need to hear them because you need credibility from scripture you don't want to just hear someone say it you want to hear the bible say it you know you want the truth from the word and i wrote mm-hmm. down romans chapter 5 verse 5 which says and this hope will not lead to disappointment we know how deeply god loves us because he has given us the holy spirit to fill our hearts with love and you know we develop endurance character and confidence of the hope and the salvation we have like god's you know gift of grace is free to all who receive it they triumph over sin because of it. And we have new life found in Jesus Christ. And Romans 8, 1 says, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And no matter what sin you've done, there's no condemnation. You love Jesus, accepted him. He accepts you. And he's willing to go to the pits of hell with you. He's willing to go to heaven with you. He's, he's going to go everywhere with you. So you're not alone. There's hope for you because Jesus is there. You know, it's, it's a good comfort. Amen. I encourage people to read the Bible for themselves, the whole thing, because I guess the people that haven't read the Bible through all the way, they're quick to point out God's wrath in the Old Testament. And look at all these horrible things that God supposedly did. But I find great value in reading the Old Testament, the whole Bible, in fact, because you will find out that the greatest, the people in the Bible that we look up to have messed up royally. Am I right? Yes, <laughs> they have are. messed up. I mean, the, the patriarchs of the faith, Moses and Noah and even Paul, we have so many people in the Bible, the judges. I mean, Deuteronomy is a mess. Mm-hmm. Many of the judges, King David, a man after God's own heart, King David, made some horrible mistakes, but you will see throughout scripture that God still takes them back. God still has that covenant with his people. God still died on the cross for us to save us from our sin. He still forgives us. And that's so encouraging. That's what gets me in my Bible every day is I hear these stories about other people in in the Bible that, okay, because you're going to learn that you're not alone. Mm-hmm. With these struggles, uh, people of faith have struggled. Abraham is a huge example. He made all kinds of uh, mistakes. Yeah, but look, God used him mightily, and, and God can still use us mightily, right? Mm-hmm. God's using you mightily, Brenna, your podcast. So is it like all rainbows and unicorns when we decide to stick to our convictions and follow the Lord? Is it smooth sailing on from here when we decide? Oh, follow God. God. 
I, I love this question and I also hate this question at the same time. Being, I'll just say this right now. Even if we weren't living in a sinful world, like, I mean, I'm an Eve. You know, following through with your convictions or listening, even when it's hard, is not always going to be sunshine and rainbows. That's for sure. Oh, gosh. I got so many verses for this one. Let me tell you. <laughs> it is going to be hard. So don't don't get discouraged. Pastor says, master the restart. If you fall down, get back up. Right? Mm-hmm. I can't do this. This is really hard. Like, you know, whether it's with sexual temptation or even just anything, you know, we're not called to be perfect people. We're just called to follow a per- supernatural being, the creator who made us. And it's not so easy. You know, we're God's children. We're set apart. And by being set apart, we might feel a little bit excluded. We might feel a little bit lonely. The world's hated uh, hates you because it hated me first. And that's right. Jesus talking, you know, mm-hmm. we're not going to be socially accepted. We're going to be, you know, ignored or belittled, or maybe even like bashed on because we're not part of the world. Like we stand out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's good stuff. I think community is really important to be in a community, whether it's church or a Bible study or the YMCA or Surrounding yourself with the people that that support you makes the Christian life easier. I mean, that's why your mom told you not to hang out with the wrong crowd, because it doesn't really help. No, it doesn't. Surround yourself with people that that can lift you up. People like Brenna. I try. (laughs) Tangent here, but. I love it. All this stuff has been gold, let me tell you. You guys, you guys need to listen to her podcast because she's got she's got even more good stuff. I so appreciate you coming on the podcast and just sitting here like girl talk with our, our tea and being real with people. And I appreciate your transparency and your honesty. And and yes, we giggled and <laughs> we were embarrassed and talking about a kind of a difficult topic. But I think the listeners really got a lot of value today and some grace and encouragement. So thank you. I really had fun too. Like it was really nice opening up and also just sharing my experience, but also bringing back to Christ. And thanks for allowing me to ramble because I know I could do that very easily sometimes. So again, I like your style of ramble. So that's why I had you on the show. <laughs> Good. She's like. Let's do it again. So tell people where they can connect with you and listen to your podcast. Well, let's see. My, if you have Spotify like me, my podcast is on there. It's also on Beaker called Beyond Just Christian. And that can be found on Apple uh, too as well. I know most people use Apple Anchor, which is what it's on and then Spotify. So I always mention those ones. But um, also for another like topic related to sex I talk about uh the topic of sex for teens which is on my friend Adelaide's website which is called the stone and the oak.com and I feel like that's also important too because it's more for teenagers versus you know adults like it is on this podcast so if you want to check it out too I'll also have a sign I'll put in the show notes if you would if that's okay with you too oh absolutely but yeah and- Otherwise, I don't have much socials. My Instagram's private, so I don't really accept much on there. So I always just say my podcast and any articles I've written, I kind of like want to show those off a little bit more too. <laughs> well, you, we didn't even talk about your current boyfriend, so you'll have to listen to the podcast to find out about him and his shenanigans. So it's probably the best, healthiest relationship I had, so I'm keeping him. <laughs> At least God tells me no. <laughs> he sounds like a keeper. He is, that's for sure. Anyway, God bless you, sister. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast. If this episode has been helpful to you, please hit the subscribe button and tell a friend. You can connect with us at dswministries.org, where you'll find our blog along with our Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel links. Hope to see you next week.